quotation is also on I didn't see the news yesterday, but I, the best I could understand from my computer, uh, Lindsey Graham has kind of forced uh, Nancy Pelosi to do, to do a vote, which she doesn't, which she doesn't know she has the uh, the uh, votes that she needs, but I was just uh, not where I was studying last night, but I heard some things on the, on Facebook. Uh, Acts 23.3 when uh, uh, Paul was before the council. Oh, I saw that. <laughs> and uh, the uh, high priest told them to smite him on the mouth. And then Paul said to him, God shall smite you, you white, white wall. For since you to judge me after the law and command me to be smitten contrary to the law. Okay, so this, this uh, impeachment inquiry is contrary to the law. It has been operating contrary to the law. So I believe we can come into agreement that God will smite those who have been operating contrary to the law. Are y'all in agreement with this? Amen. Yes. Smack them good one. Huh? Smack them good one. <laughs> we, got to, we got to smite in Amos chapter 3 today. Lord Jesus, I ask you for all on this. And I'm calling this message the corruption of the elect. And of course, you know, all of you are elect of God, so. Uh, now, this is my water. Is that enough? Mm -hmm. Want some more? Good. Okay. And he continues the principle of God that to whom much is given, much will be required. For those who are chosen, there is great responsibility. Uh, many people desire a platform. Hey, Jenny, come on in. Or they, they desire a platform for attention, to get attention, or to get recognition, or well, and 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 money. You know, they don't realize that they're going to be held accountable for that platform. Election of God is not merely a form of favoritism. Instead, we, like Israel, have a special reason to expect God's judgment upon our sin and our failures and what God called us to do as to whether we have done it or whether we have been slack in doing it. And what God, as through the years, okay, I, I guess I'll say, we do not go on our ability, our physical ability, our resources, or what we see that we have when God tells us to do something. You go on his ability to do it through you, and then we obey, and in our obedience, then he does it. And that's where we have to come, and then we're going to be held accountable for that. Okay, if you're called by God, if you're elect of God in the kingdom of God to do a certain work, then I cannot say, God, I'm too old, I'm not strong enough, I don't have enough money, I, I'm not smart enough, I'm not pretty enough, I'm not skinny enough, all these things that we are not enough, we will be held accountable for offering those excuses to God when he has called us to do a certain work. Mm -hmm. I told you, we asked God to pour some oil on them. <laughs> <laughs> to be chosen by God is to be under more accountability. Mm 
But whatever God called you to do, do it with great joy and don't give him excuses as to why he should use someone else and why it's not really a good idea to use you. You know, this Moses got in big trouble over there. He lost. He, he got in all kinds of trouble because it, the last time, you know, he kept telling God no. And then the last time he said, uh, God, just get someone else you for this job. He didn't really want to do it. He was out there in the middle of the wilderness. And, he, and uh, so I'm, I'm telling you, church, whatever God has called you to do, do it with great joy. And don't be telling him to get somebody else. For the church of the 21st century, Angus's words of justice and judgment are not just for Israel, but as we're watching for all nations and peoples of the earth. In this oracle, the judgment is for the elect in whatever generation or whatever nation it's in. I posted Kim Clement's word last night, uh, exposures. Balls in the fall. Okay, we're having them fall. Fall, fall. They're different maybe than the ones we, we're ready to see fall. But they're falling. One by one. The ones God has chosen to expose. I'm seeing kind of in backgrounds that there's a lot, still, there's a lot of pedophile raids going on. People are being arrested. And it's not getting a whole lot of uh, mm -hmm. a news coverage uh, because they're not famous people. But there's still a lot of pedophile raids going on. Okay, so there are five oracles of God in this um, in, the, in these little 13 verses. I think we've got 13 verses. Um, three of the oracles begin with the proclamation, hear this word. And two commence with the expression woe, depending on which interp which Bible interpretation you're going to get to. So the words of Amos, that it was, as I told you, there's been great emphasis put on the words of Amos. These are holy words. And these holy words of Amos are living words. And as I have said, I believe the justice that he is proclaiming to the earth is the same justice that God is operating in today. God does not change. Amen. Amos 3, 1 through 3. Hear this word, that the Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, saying, You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they are agreed? Where there is not friendship and respect, there cannot be fellowship. I said Sunday morning that snarky is not a word that pleases God. We have great respect for one another in this church. And as I have rightly so, I have great view, I have great respect for the people in this church. And rightly so, you have earned my respect because of what God has brought us through as a church. And I've seen you stand, and it's been an awesome thing to, to respect you and to give you that respect, that respect is due. And if you respect someone, you're not going to backstab them. Amen. There will be no cut downs, there will be no put downs. Cut downs and put downs are out of jealousy. Mm -hmm. I know a meeting, about six months before somebody gets ready to leave the church, I watch it. They'll start just, just for, you know, mm -hmm. I'll just be walking around and they'll snap me. Mm -hmm. Okay, I thought, okay, they're getting ready to leave the church. And um, see, they're trying to justify mm -hmm. what they're getting ready to do. And but see if see and but unless can two walk together except they are agreed. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
See, once they come out of agreement, well, what happens is, it isn't that they get, get mad at me, because I'm just standing up here preaching the word. They have decided that they're going to go another way. <laughs> In their mind, they have made another choice. Their choice is not to go with God, but their choice is to go their own way. So, they, so then here comes the little, they've made another choice. So, uh, Amos is telling us, can two walk together except they are agreed? And people of God, if we are agreed, we will respect one another, we will honor one another, mm -hmm. there will be friendship, and in that place we will have fellowship, and the church will come into that place of unity that God answers our prayers in. Where two or three are gathered together, there I am in the midst of you. And when two or three are gathered together in unity, then God delights to answer our prayer. Ask of me what you will and I'll give it to you. When we are in unity. Okay. Clearly the prophet is emphatic about the covenant relationship between God and his people. The fact that Israel had been caught up out of Egypt forms the basis for God's claim and sovereignty over them. But you and I, Christian, have a greater responsibility. Hebrews 10, 29. Well, how much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. So our okay, so just as Amos is saying, okay, Israel, God, God's place speaking, not not Amos. Uh, I brought you out of Israel. I kept I brought you through that wilderness. I fed you. I took care of you. I have kept you. So I, 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 I took down all those kings that were in Canaan. I've set y'all up. I blessed you. And still you are not worshiping me or walking with me. Okay, look how much more he's done for us as Christians. And the church today, and I can speak to the church at large, certainly not East Gate Church, because I've already declared how much I respect and honor these people in this church. But I will speak to the church, the apostate church, the rebellious church, those who are living the way they want to live and read the word the way they want to read, I will say to you that this word is for you today. Mm -hmm. And that God, it will judge the church in the same way that he judged Israel, but we have more accountability. This may be it. You know, I had that dream about machine guns coming at me. You know, this may be it. And as I preach Sunday, grace keeps us from sinning. Mm -hmm. Grace gives us God's power to overcome sin. Grace does not cover our sin, and grace does not give us permission to sin. Mm -hmm. yes. So this is what Amos is saying. Hey, you, hey, look what all God did for you. Christian, we have more accountability than Israel did. I personally don't want to displease the Lord and have him speak words like this against me. Oh, how much... Uh, they, I'm gonna, this is the word he spoke against his elect. I'm going to go back to 1 through 3. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you. The Lord has spoken against you, O children of Israel, against the whole family which I brought up from the land of Egypt, that you have only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. Can two walk together except they are agreed? God says you can't walk with me unless you agree with me. You can't walk with me and do it your way. So I, I stand before you today that I, will, I do not want for God to ever speak those words over me. That he is against me. Yeah. Um, 
in the fact if the favor of God does not restrain us from acts of sin and when I say restrain us from acts of sin if God's blessing on my life God's grace on my life God's goodness on my life God's power over my life the power of the blood over my life the awesomeness of knowing it the awesome things that I know about God over my life does not restrain me from sin, then nothing will. And they had, they saw and they knew the awesome works of God. And then we will not be exempt from God's judgment. You heard me say Sunday morning that and I'm coming into agreement with Johnny Enlow's prophecy. That which is happening on the world, earth right now is destructive, but it is not catastrophic. The church still has time to repent and to get our hearts right with God. The nations still have time to repent because that which God is doing on the earth is disruptive, but it is not now yet catastrophic. And that which Amos prophesied to Israel was became catastrophic. Everything was destroyed. And they were totally thrown out of their land. Okay, I told the Lord Jesus help me with this. Amos proceeds to authenticate both his message and his calling as a prophet. The sayings are a very skillful linkage of cause and effect. And for the next few chapters, he gives us these little parables of cause and effect, cause and effect. His questions can only be answered by agreement. He doesn't really give you a chance to disagree with him the way he presents this. The, conclu <laughs> the conclusion of the matter is just as natural events are linked, so too are God's words to Israel. His words are wisdom and observations derived from his life as a shepherd. I thought about last night. There, but he probably wasn't the only one hanging around in those sick, the sycamore wild fig trees, um, working in those fig trees. There was probably other shepherds out there as they were watching their sheep or other, other sycamore gatherers. And he obtained the expertise in technique a proverbial argument. It is, it is, he gives you a proverb as you go down through here. It really doesn't mean you anything to teach or say when he finishes. He gives you the proverb and then he tells you what the answer is and then you don't have any, you're not given any choice in the matter. <laughs> it's funny. But here's number one. Amos 3, 4. Will a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Will his young lion cry out of his den if he has taken nothing? I got on my lion necklace today. <laughs> <laughs> no lion roars upon his prey. Nor will God give us warning if he has not really about to fall upon people with judgment. People, God is roaring. With all these activities that are going on upon the earth, it seems to me that even the heathen that don't even know the Bible could figure this out. But see, and that when they read the Bible, they don't know what it says. Because it takes the Holy Spirit to, to open up to what it says. So we have the metaphor of the roar of the lion. When the lion roars, judgment is imminent. The Lord speaking through the word and his prophets are not just threatenings. It is their own sin that has entangled them. Verse 5, can a bird fall in a snare upon the earth where no gin is for him? Nothing but their own repentance can disentangle them. Shall one take up a snare from the earth and have taken nothing at all? Shall a trumpet be blown in the city and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in the city and the Lord has not done it? When the prophets speak, the people ought to tremble before God. A 
as they would on the sounding of a trumpet. Yet when God, by his prophet, gives them notice of their danger, it makes no impression. Right now, your television screen, and this group knows it because you know your Bible. I'm always teaching to the teachers. I mean, y'all already know as much as I do. Mm -hmm. So we just bring it forth. Um, you look at your television screen and you're watching the Bible unfold before your eyes. Mm -hmm. But it makes no impression. It's not even making an impression on a large part of the church. They do not know what the time is. They do not know what the season is because they do not know what the Word of God is saying. The words of God which are written are not obeyed or honored even by Christians. Nobody reads Amos anymore, but let's preach it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting there, and God has to forgive me because I'm thinking, oh God, Nobody wants to hear this. <laughs> but these are, these are the words of the Lord. They didn't want to hear it then. And that's when that priest kind of laying them, hey, get out of here. Don't drop your words around here. People, we are walking through the words of Amos on the earth today. No one knows it, and the preachers are holding back from preaching it. I was talking to myself, when God tells you to do something, you don't tell him why you shouldn't do it. Somebody posted on the Eastgate Facebook page, I forget what I was preaching, something. Sure, it's something to do with judgment. And um, uh, someone was commenting on it, and some guy comes on there and he says, uh, there's not very many people there, it must not be popular. <laughs> I don't think these words will ever be popular. I don't think Amos was fine. Well, the Bible says that he was preaching this to a small group. But they made it through 3,000 years. And the words have stayed alive for 3,000 years. Okay. Verse 7. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. We all know that scripture. The promise is just as true in the church of the 21st century as it was at the time Amos spoke these words. Because these words are not from Amos, these words are from God. And God's words do not change. God has set prophets upon the earth that we didn't have when I was a child. They could tell you what you did when you were born. Some of their gifts are so keen. And, when, and, and God has sent these prophets to minister to us and to strengthen the church and to bring the church forward, not to tickle our ears or to have a feel-good prophecy, which is, much of that has become that, or to get a good offering. But these same prophets, I speak to you, prophets. I'm speaking to you. These same prophets that can speak in your personal life, God is going to hold them accountable to speak what he is saying and doing on the earth at this time, not just to give a feel-good word. Amen. And they don't want to deliver that. Some, some will. Some will. Some will. Surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. And I will say this to you, prophets. I have seen many of you hold back uh, because of the cameras. I've seen many of you hold back because you thought you might get persecuted. I've seen many of you hold back just because you didn't want to deliver the word. We're going to be held accountable for that. I'm just saying. I said we. We're all going to be held accountable for it. The secret of God is in a peculiar
peculiar manner with the prophets, to whom the spirit of prophecy is the spirit of revelation. The prophets have to speak that which God has made known to them. They receive a command from God to deliver what they've been charged with. They will be false to their trust if they do not do so. I've been charged to preach the book of Amos. Amos 3a. The lion has roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? told y'all that before God called me into the ministry full time I heard the roar of the lion it's a long time ago and I came out the gate prophets I mean it just rolled out of my mouth I was prophesying judgment that's been I was before a pastor I heard the lion roar I didn't know anything the lion roared in me and out of me came these, you know, what the line was saying. That would be 35 years ago. And oh my goodness. That was just like Amos. Don't drop your words around here. This is not the way to preach. People are not going to listen to you. Don't preach. Pastors told me don't preach this way. People don't want to hear the book of Revelation, Carolyn. They don't want to hear the book of Daniel. Preach easy words. I found some people that do. Amos <laughs> <laughs> has heard God's voice, and the thunder is rumbling. The storm is approaching, and it is up on Israel for the, and it's up on the elect church today. Of course, we know from history that this was fulfilled prophecy, not only in 750 B.C., but in 70 A.D., and I would say in 1945, when we dropped the bomb on Japan. The Israelites were not only convicted with Amos' prophecy, but they were condemned. God sends his prophets at the midnight hour before he gets ready to move. Still giving us time to get right with the Lord. Notice of their soon coming judgment is ordered to be given to their neighbors in verses 9 through 10. The prophet is ordered to publish it in the, in the palaces of Ashdod, one of the chief cities of the Philistines. The summons must be go even to the palaces of Egypt. God's controversies with sinners do not fear a scrutiny. Okay? You know, we got lots of scrutiny going on out there, especially on Facebook. You know, he said, if you, if you, you know, if, if something just isn't quite right, somebody's going to straighten you out. And I don't, and, and I see I've got some typos in here because I was tired last night and I didn't go back and edit this. But do you know that when you are preaching the Word of God, you preach it, you state it, you let it lay there, and then whoever wants to scrutinize it, you let them go. That's the reason why. I post every message on that page, on my website. You want to scrutinize what this church preaches. You want to scrutinize the Word of God. You want to find the error. You want to see what's wrong. It's written in black and white on our on our website. Go read it. See, you don't fear scrutiny. I have no fear of scrutiny. I don't have a reputation. I don't need to say it. <laughs> Anything that I need to say would be my ego. Even Philistines and Egyptians will be made to see 
that the ways of the Lord are equal, but the ways of the sinner are unequal. And we can take this right now as we're looking at what's going on in our government. Okay? Those who are moving in that which is evil, watch. Their actions and their ways will be unequal. They are not afraid of scrutiny. They're not afraid to put out there everything they say, everything they do, everything that they're doing for the whole world to see. But the way of the sinner, they're trying to hide from the scrutiny of the world. It will always be that way. Now, I'm not talking about things that are confidential. There are things that are confidential that you don't spread out before the whole world. But things that are evil will always be kept from scrutiny. Mm -hmm. We're watching that play out right now. Yes, we are. Okay, 9 through 10. Publish in the palaces of Ashdod and in the palaces and the palaces in the land of Egypt and say, assemble yourselves upon the mountains of Samaria and behold the great tumult in the midst thereof and the oppressed in the midst thereof for they know not to do right says the Lord who store up violence and robbery in their palaces now I'm talking to the United States of America I'm talking to the leaders of the nations of the world I'm talking to the church Great tumults are indicative of the rights and wars we're pres presently seeing in the streets of many nations. I saw someone posted, I don't know if it was the president, that uh, he is not encouraging lawlessness, he's not encouraging violence in our streets, and he's not encouraging riots. That that is being, is being dealt with as lawlessness, and it wasn't before. Lawlessness had just about taken over this nation. Let us continue to pray for Barr. He's got a big job in heaven. I thought where something I read where Barr was commending uh, Ray, the FBI director, for doing for helping him and doing a good job. So maybe we should. We've been trying to remove Ray. <laughs> maybe we should pray that. He will come up under bar, and he will mm -hmm. he, he will cooperate with him. Um, this scripture indicates a spirit of lawlessness resulting in oppression and acts of violence. We can add the lawlessness, lawlessness in Chicago to this. Mm -hmm. What's going on in Hong Kong, what's going on in Lebanon, what's going on in Syria, Yemen, the African, some of the African nations, Nigeria, the northern part of Nigeria, I could go on and on and on. You see, God is not going to let this continue. Um, the Word of God says they do not know how to do right. It is the business of the church and our failure to teach and preach families to follow after right. If they do not know, we have a whole generation out there that doesn't know how to do right. They don't even know what right is. They call evil good and good evil. Because no one has held up a moral standard and said this is the moral standard of God. They are making their own standards, creating their own rules and laws. And they're calling evil good and good evil. And they're, ca they're calling that to be the, uh, the law of the land. And they want us to change the laws of God to uh, align with that law. I don't know who that might be. Okay. Distract me there. For what is that? The law of the land. Yeah. Okay. They are literally trying to change the laws of our nation 
to align with the laws they are making, which cause evil good and good evil. The word right means what is straightforward and honest in contrast to what is false. And in this context, Amos seems to use the word to mean what is acceptable and right in relation to uh, court and trade practices as well as, um, of course, what is right in the eyes of God. The fortresses, the palaces, had become treasuries in which the rich were able to store the profits of plunder and loot. 311. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, an adversary there shall be even round about the land, and he shall bring them down, he shall bring down your strength from you, and your palaces shall be spoiled. Okay, so this judgment is from God. God is sending the Assyrian in. He is stripping the, the Assyrian to totally take away their strength. Excuse me. Excuse me, I had a sneeze come up there. Okay, the therefore. There, when, I, when therefore is there, you ask it what it's there for. <laughs> therefore. <laughs> states the moral logic that due to the aggressive greed of the principal people, that nation would be destroyed. Thank you. The Assyrians had already been called upon to witness the evils of the land, and now Amos envisages them as the instrument of God's judgment. 312. That says the Lord. As the shepherd takes out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out that dwell in Samaria in the corner of a bed and in Damascus in a couch. The word for Damascus is only used one time. This word for Damascus is only used one time in the Bible because I was trying to make sense out of this. So I looked it up to see what they're using it for. It doesn't mean the nation at all. It means uh, damask or silk. And the word is D-E-M-E-H-S-H-E-K, and which is not the same word that is used for the nation of Damascus. It's only used one time in the Bible. That helps to make more sense in trying to translate this verse. Well, really, if we do, we have to translate it, these words, because see what they meant to the people there, they understood what he was talking about. Especially the shepherds and the sycamore pickers. Because <laughs> I guess this is the way they communicated with each other. You know, the shepherd takes out of the mouth the line two legs that are in the place of ear. You know, they knew what he was talking about. Um, this is a parable written and spoken in parabolic language. A shepherd retrieving part of a sheep from a lion is compared to the situation that will follow the destruction of Israel by the Assyrian onslaught. That's how bad it's going to be. Read that again. Thus says the Lord, as a shepherd takes out of the mouth of the lion two legs or a piece of an ear, so shall the children of Israel be taken out. That's total, that's total destruction. That's catastrophic. We're not there yet. We're not in the catastrophic. Um, this style is that of a popular proverb and was used often by Jesus. Such says Amos will be the fate of Israel. The roar of the lion had already been heard and it's destructively was near at hand. I suppose at the time that Amos gave this word, there was no more repentance left in the way he presented it. Even if the escape to Samaria, even if, 
even if they escaped to Samaria by hiding themselves in the corner of a bed or on a silk couch, <coughs> they will still be found and taken out. Okay, just like uh, Bag Daddy. I got him right now. I got his name right. Yeah. Bag Daddy. Yeah. Yes. Al Bag Daddy. Yeah. I've been trying to call him Ben Daddy or something. <laughs> he was found at the end of a tunnel. And they had to dig him out of the rubble after he blew himself up. There's no place to hide from God when God decides to deal with us. That's right. Their spirits shall be quite cowed and broken. Mm -hmm. 13 through 14. Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts, that in the day that I shall visit the transgressions of Israel upon him, I will also visit the altars of Bethel, and the horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. Here he is described as the God of hosts, that is the captain of the angel armies. When God comes as the captain of the angel armies, he's coming with all the hosts of the heavens. And as we have learned through our studies, the host of heaven is the warrior angels of heaven and they are kept in the four corners of heaven and only brought forth when God goes to war. And when people go to heaven, not everybody gets to go to that far corner of heaven except the warriors. This is a war cry from the God of hosts, the captain of the angel armies. Hmm. Hear ye and testify in the house of Jacob, says the Lord God, the God of hosts. Then in that day shall I visit the transgressions of Israel upon him. The captain of the angel armies just says I'm coming. Woe to their altars, for God will visit them. He will bring into account all their superstition and idolatry. We're in a season when superstition is all over the earth mm -hmm. right now at, at, at Halloween. And there's witchcraft going on and all sorts of witches are acting up. Superstition of any kind is sin. Mm -hmm. If you are superstitious of anything, you are getting that more power than the blood of Jesus. Because yes. <clears throat> the blood of Jesus against that situation, our superstition gives power to evil. All power in heaven and earth and under the earth has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We have power over all of this witchcraft that's going to be going on during this season. Mm -hmm. God has given it to you. He who has been given all power in heaven and earth and under the earth abides in you. Okay. The horns of the altar shall be cut off and fall to the ground. And with them, the altar itself broke into pieces. The altars of Bethel symbolized Israel's religion. The judgment at the altars of the altars symbolized the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant, the altar that has the horns of the altar, symbolizes the very presence of God. God says, "I believe in you, Boaz. I'm going to turn against you." I'm going to bring the host of angel armies against you. And still they didn't get scared to death. The judgment will be both upon the religious and civil aspects of the nation's life. We must believe this is going on in our nation and the nations of the world at this time. Not only in the media, okay, Washington, D.C., Hollywood, pedophiles, sex trade, and the justice system being judged, but those who are called my church are also being judged. It is time, church. I'm speaking out to this precious group of people. Ever, that I'm speaking to those out there in Facebook and whoever listens to this message. It is time for those who are called my church, while there is still time for you to get your life right with God. 
a fugitive could obtain sanctuary by holding on to the horns of the altar. I think it was Absalom that did, and some um, Adonijah, some people got in trouble and they held on to the horns of the altar. I don't know if it did them any good or not. Amos 3.15. And I will smite the winter house with the summer house, and the houses of ivory shall perish, and the great houses shall have an end, says the Lord. Mm. Woe to their houses, for God will visit them too. He will inquire into the robbery they have stored up in their houses and the luxury in which they lived. The smite of God is his destruction. We have a promise in Genesis 8.21 where God says, Neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. Amen. 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 Mm. <laughs> yeah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We preach the word of God. As it is written.